Hi class, let us continue on with the soteriological group of books as we study 1 Corinthians in this session. Let us also keep in mind that we are dealing with the questions of salvation. Who is speaking Paul? To whom the new church in Corinth? Uh, new as in it's a couple years old. It's had the opportunity to develop, but at the same time have paganism introduced in. And uh, as we're going to study today, Paul addresses that from afar. Uh, the soteriological group uh, are the epistles of the cross, and they are uh, describing the role of our Savior Jesus Christ from the standpoint of Calvary. So the theme of this whole group is atonement of Christ. And I like to remind people there's an easy definition for atonement. It's at one with Christ. At one with Christ. And I think you'll find that that is a, a, a clever little uh, definition that will help your congregation or your class uh, remember uh, what atonement means. It's bringing us back together unified again with Christ, the way it was intended to be from the creation. So let's look at the timeline. A critical point in uh, church history was the Jerusalem uh, Council, where the issue was put to rest regarding can Gentiles be saved and do they have to blend their faith of Jesus Christ in with uh, the law? And the Judaizers, uh, they were defeated, soundly defeated, yet they still took their show on the road and antagonized Paul and the apostles. But if you mark that time stamp of 50 AD, um, that's a critical milestone in the development of the church. So these epistles are an outcome of that controversy. Uh, of course, we studied the book of Galatians as we saw that as an emancipation of Christianity out of Judaism. Now we're going to see in 1 Corinthians, it addresses within the church perversion of the gospel uh, by inconsistent conduct. Uh, we claim the right doctrine, but do we live it? And then we'll see in 2 Corinthians and uh, Romans as this goes further. Uh, the longest epistles are in this group, nearly 60% of Paul's writings. So, with no further uh, introduction, let's jump right into the book of 1 Corinthians, full of rich passages that are quoted often. Uh, do you not know that all who run the race, they, they run to win? They run to win for the prize. Um, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those that love him. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And then, of course, the dissertation on love is. Uh, wonderful, rich passages, but you will be able to apply them more accurately and more vividly if you describe them from the perspective of the context of why the letter was written. Why was the letter written? That's what we're going to address today. Um, you may have a friend that has uh, taken the tours in uh, Europe of the travels of Paul. And if you go there today, you'll find many uh, rich uh, excavated sites uh, that um, verify the things that the Bible wrote as the culture and the events and the special uh, places uh, were written 2,000 years ago in the Bible, and the archaeologists can uh, reveal those for us even today. Um, famous roads that the Romans and the Greeks had built. Uh, one thing I'd like to remind everybody is the, uh, the Roman Empire was quite a sophisticated um, empire in the way that uh, there were many structures, there was much infrastructure that was quite frankly impressive. Uh, it would even be impressive by today's standards. And uh, those were the, the streets that Paul walked. And some places were quite palatial and well-developed. More uh, proof of the 
Bible's accuracy as it mentions things. Here's an inscription found along the road uh, for Erastus, recognizing that um, hardly known character in history was mentioned in the Bible in Romans 16.23. And um, by God's grace, uh, his name was uncovered as a leader uh, at that time. Corinth itself uh, is an interesting place, uh, mainly due to its location, as with uh, most uh, famous sites. If you study archaeology and you understand why are certain cities uh, prominent locations, um, it's because, uh, one, they're in a location that's easy to defend, two, uh, you can grow food nearby, and three, you must be able to have access to water uh, in the event of a siege. You have to uh, be able to live on stored food and continue to have fresh water for a long period of time. Corinth meets all those qualifications. But beyond that, uh, that's why it was a, a famous location uh, for um, the time of Homer, uh, all the way through Alexander and the, and the time of the Romans. But it become a very uh, successful uh, commercial city because of a strategic location. It has gulfs on two sides of the city. It's elevated about a half mile, so there's no problem with flooding, but yet it's easy to get access to water. Um, and because of its elevated uh, position, it is visible from Athens, and they were kind of rivals with Athens, and it was always a little bit of an irritant uh, for the Athenians to see the Corinthians uh, one-up them. In Homer, I mean history, Homer considered it as wealthy Corinth. It was Alexander's great city. Matter of fact, it was the center of Hellenistic culture. And that's why the Romans had to destroy it in 146 B.C. It was a, an effort to demoralize the Greeks as they were being conquered. And then, of course, Julius Caesar, a hundred years later, realizes the strategic value of the location. So he reestablished it again as a commercial center. And it was this uh, commercial center uh, rebuilt by Julius Caesar is what was in existence at the time of Christ. Why was it so valuable commercially? It was the uh, uh, very immediate route for merchandise that would travel between Italy and Asia uh, as far as the north. Consider the location, as you can see on this map. You have a port that makes it easy to transport um, goods to the north, and you also have a connector between the east and the west. Now, on this map, you may say, well, that's not that, that big of a connector. Uh, all you have to do is go around the, the southern tip of Greece. It's not that much further. That's true in times of seasons of good weather. That was not a big deal. However, when you uh, during the winter months, when you uh, went out into the region of the Mediterranean Sea and was exposed to severe waves and rocks, it was dangerous. And we saw that example during the time of Paul where there was the shipwreck where they shouldn't have been traveling during that season to start with. But if you wanted to travel during the wintertime and stay away from the Mediterranean um, hazards, you would cross over land, believe it or not, at Corinth. They had a tramway, and I've uh, shown a picture of this tramway. You can see the grooves that are still in the rock. They would take large ships, and they would uh, dry dock them and then transport them by cart across that, uh, that isthmus, narrow isthmus of land. Or they could uh, unload the cargo and ship it across um, and pick up on another ship uh, on the other side when going east to west. You can imagine how those who set up business along this tramway, uh, especially were uh, at both of the seas, how that was a great location for commerce. So with this in mind, you can easily understand why Corinth 
was a location of many classes of people, international travelers, traders, agents. There was uh, great wealth. But at the same time, where there's great wealth and the need for cheap labor, there was extreme poverty. And they were side by side. Um, somewhere between 600, 700,000 residents, approximately two-thirds of them were slaves because of the amount of work that needed to be done. They were uh, cultivated in the arts, where Athens focused more on philosophy, Corinth focused more on the arts. And they were uh, involved in what we now call the Olympic Games, but at their location, it was called the Isthmian Games, and they were just as successful and just as large as the games in Athens. So again, the two cities uh, were uh, kind of in competition. You might say in American sports, it was the Cleveland Browns versus the Pittsburgh Steelers, and there was a, a certain love-hate relationship between the two cities. When you consider morals, Corinth was known as a wicked city. It was the headquarters of the temple of Aphrodite for the Greeks. And then when the Romans come along, uh, Aphrodite was dethroned, if you will, for the Roman god of Venus. Both were goddesses of love. Both um, involved temple prostitutes, uh, certainly paganism at its worst. And where you had this combination of the Eastern Europe, or I'm sorry, Western Europe and the Eastern Asia cultures and lots of money, uh, you had more or less the, uh, the dregs of foulness uh, would be a, a fair way of explaining it. Um, similar to what we talk about in the gold rush of the United States where the, the, it tends to be the people that had the most money, the people that were most desperate for more money, combined together uh, to uh, take advantage of one another. Now, during the time of Paul, um, he visited Corinth during his second missionary journey. He spent um, more than a year and a half there. Now, it was ample time to move a church out of a synagogue, establish a church, teach a church, and then see um, the Judaizers, pagans, come in in an effort to um, undermine his efforts. Now, during his third missionary journey, he painted a dark picture of paganism, as he uh, referred to in Romans chapter 1, heavily influenced by what was going on there in Corinth. So let's talk about the beginning of the church. Uh, in Acts chapter 18, after a brief unsuccessful stint in Athens, hence Mars Hill, Paul left Athens fairly quickly and he went to Corinth, apparently by himself. He meets Aquila and Priscilla who become uh, soulmates of his, if you would. Uh, similar habits, uh, they were all tent makers, they were in love with Jesus and um, they become lifetime friends. Now, when there was the arrival of Timothy and Silas coming back from the north, there was the occasion, as we studied before, of writing First and Second Thessalonians as well as Galatians. Paul was writing these letters in response to Timothy and Silas's reports as to how the church was faring when Paul was not in town and. As we recall in 1 Thessalonians, as soon as he heard the good report from Timothy, he had to uh, issue 1 Thessalonians as fast as he could. And then in 2 Thessalonians, it was a little bit more thought out or more methodical, a little bit more in depth. When Silas came, he brought an offering from Philippi, which is the perfect example of missionary giving, missionary support. Um, it, just benevolent giving of one church to help out the foreign missions project, as we still continue to do today. And he reminds the Corinthians later on that he didn't come there and take their money. Matter of fact, there were other people who were giving um, out of need. They were giving so that uh, the church at Corinth could continue to have Paul there 
and uh, not have to work. <clears throat> so um, with fierce opposition, uh, early on in the church, he realizes that there's too much tension and conflict in the synagogue. He moves the believers out of the synagogue. They go near the house of Titus Justus, and the members in the church include Greek converts and even Crispus, the leader of the synagogue. Uh, therefore, he established a good connection with the Greek community. Now, the church at Corinth um, could be characterized by this. Paul feared a repetition of the opposition, and he intended to leave to spare the church persecution. We know what happened in Thessalonica, and these same individuals are behind the, the scenes um, trying to cause problems at Corinth, and he did not want another situation where church members would be thrown in jail and have to post bond, surety bonds, in order to get out. So he's getting ready to leave, apparently. But in Acts 18, the Lord assures Paul that he will be protected. The Lord's not finished in Corinth, and he wants, he wants him to continue um, to work there. So Paul was accused of this, leading worship contrary to the law. Now think about that. You're not in Judah. You're not in Jerusalem. You're in Corinth. And the leaders, the religious leaders, are wanting to bring legal action against him because of worship contrary to their law. Well, Gallio, the new Roman proconsul, he was a feared man, and he should be feared because he would be happy to make an example of somebody in order to um, keep the people quiet. But he, he refused to hear the matter. He's not interested in getting involved in the Jews and their religious trouble. But Sosthenes, he's uh, antagonized probably by the synagogue, especially he's the new ruler since uh, the previous ruler followed Paul. Um, they're trying to make a statement that we're not going to continue to lose our membership to the new Christian church. So he was dissatisfied that he couldn't bring legal action. So he continued to antagonize Gallio and he himself, as we see in verse 17, he was the one that pushed Gallio to the point that he was beaten himself so that Gallio could just remove this whole matter from him. But think of the impact that that had on the Greek Christians as they realize that there is even a greater substantiated following of the church that even the Roman leaders sided with Paul, not the synagogue. Certainly a shot in the arm for a, a baby church that is concerned about being persecuted by the government. So within that one and a half year time span, the membership grew and the majority was Gentiles. Uh, there were some noble people there, but mostly humble stations like slaves. And uh, some apparently had a very vivid uh, sinful past. Now, the occasion for 1 Corinthians, Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla accompanied Paul as far as Ephesus. Then Paul, he had to go on to Jerusalem, uh, as we, we know of at least on a couple of occasions, to continue to encourage the saints in Jerusalem. Now, eventually, Paul returned back to Ephesus, and this would be considered his third journey. Um, Ephesus and Corinth are close together, so while he's in Ephesus, it would be easy for him to get word from travelers of how the church at Corinth is doing. And apparently, Paul visited Corinth during his time when he came back to Ephesus. So, since 1 Corinthians 5.9 makes a reference to a previous letter, we must assume that 1 Corinthians is not the first letter he wrote, and we don't know anything about that letter, but we do know that 1 Corinthians, as we know it in our Bible, would really be the second letter. And this lost letter apparently addressed problems in the church. So instructions concerning fornication was apparently misunderstood. So 1 Corinthians was written primarily to clear up those misunderstandings uh, from the first letter. 
and to also address church factions, especially the inappropriateness that was going on in the leadership from the house of Chloe. So uh, keep in mind, and I, I like to remind people when I'm preaching, that the message of 1 Corinthians is, I told you guys how we are supposed to live. But yet, when I'm not there, you start to drift back. So I'm going to tell you again in this letter, don't make me come down there. Because if I have to come back and address sin within the leadership of the church or the membership of the church, I promise you, I will reveal through the power of Jesus Christ, I will reveal those who are living in open sin and I will deal with the problem. So I'm going to give you this chance with this written warning of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to give you this chance of the leadership you deal with the sin within your camp. Don't make me come down there. And, of course, the illustration of parents talking to their children. If I have to come up there and take care of this problem, you're going to regret it. So Paul was really chastising the church, and he was warning them. Uh, it's going to be worse if I have to show up to help you clean house with your problems. And, of course, the message is very relevant to today. While our um, our society has embraced many lifestyles and has embraced many things that the Bible calls a sin and, and said that it's within a person's choice. The Bible doesn't change. Uh, Born-again believers are to behave differently. They're supposed to demonstrate a changed life. They are supposed to demonstrate uh, a difference between the life that they used to have and now this is the life that they have today. And of course, it's quite contrary to... Uh, the desires of sinful man in society, and always will be. And if we're not living a life that appears to be in opposition to uh, uh, societal sins, then are we indeed living a life of born again, and are we honoring the king? And uh, it's tough for church leadership to um, deal with open sins. It's tough because there are relationships involved, but Paul's teaching us clearly. Doctrine and the preservation of holiness within the church is far superior to relationships with people. Doctrine champions relationship. Not popular today, but that's the teaching of Paul. So the occasion of 1 Corinthians, um, Apollos was at Ephesus to further uh, explain the situation that was going on. Paul sends uh, back, going on back at uh, Corinth. Um, Paul then sends Timothy to Corinth by way of Macedonia. You know, granted that was a a long way to go there, but that was a way of checking on all the churches. That's what he did with Timothy and Silas. He would send them on the route and get a report from all the churches. And the message he sends with Timothy is to remind them of Paul's life and his teaching. Now, shortly after Timothy departs, Paul's visited by three messengers from Corinth. Remember, that's a common shipping route, so it's not uncommon for people to go between uh, Corinth and Ephesus. And they apparently had a letter, and we see that in 1 Corinthians 16, 17. Immediately, Paul responds. With 1 Corinthians. Now, this is before he uh, has uh, time to hear back from Timothy. Um, he has to write this letter immediately to address what he has now learned from this three person delegation. So, Hebert best estimates the time and the place as he's writing from Ephesus in the year 57 AD. Now, within the book, there are dual purposes, and I'll we'll make sure you get this. It was to correct the disorders in the church, as I've already mentioned, and then it was also to answer submitted questions, uh, specifics that the people were asking for. And within the book, he goes back and forth uh, between those two purposes. So Paul gives them the opportunity to correct these matters before he returns, and then Paul avoids appearing to have lordship over them. He's not a pope. He never positions himself as uh, having papal authority, as people talk about today. Um, but 
Nevertheless, he sternly teaches what the truth of the teachings of Jesus Christ that were given to him. The characteristics of 1 Corinthians? Well, it's the epistle of the cross in social life. We must demonstrate a changed life in our social life. So we can apply the cross to every problem that we have. And we can get a reasonable understanding of a biblical uh, direction solution to every problem we have. Uh, primarily practical rather than doctrinal, yet the epistle does include the cross is either a stumbling stone or a cornerstone in life. And a builder's works will be tested by the righteous judgmental fire of God. Wood, hay, stubble will burn up. We have further understanding of uh, what the Lord's Supper meant and how it's to be applied. We recognize the local church is not a company or an organization. It is part of a living, breathing organism, like a body. And we recognize the power and worth of God's love and human life. That's why he gets involved in our daily um, situations. As far as the new revelations in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's self-control is distressful. In distressful situations, he wants to lash out. It appears that he withholds his emotions and tries to stay factual. The interior life of the apostolic age church, not any different than what we have today. Those folks struggled with holiness and doctrine as much as we did. Maybe more because these writ letters had not yet been written down. In fact, I feel certain at the judgment, you and I, having... Uh, time to uh, read these letters and comprehend and study from wise uh, uh, scholars that helped pull the points together uh, and cross-reference them in other places in the Bible, we will be held more accountable to the teachings of 1 Corinthians than the church at Corinth was because they did not yet have uh, the letters in their hand. So, out of the distresses of these churches... We see God has seen fit to give us one of the priceless treasures of the New Testament, and that is 1 Corinthians. And now we know what he intends for a church to do, how he intends for a church to solve problems, how we, he intends for a church to administer the Lord's Supper. And if we will just, as a church leadership, if we will just apply the lessons in this one book alone, we will find that we will have a Christ-centered church, which is a living organism that he can bless. And that's what we, we desire, is to promote the doctrines of the church through the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you that you teach us how to have church. You teach us how to lead church. You teach us how to deal with um, social problems within the church and how you love the individual uh, and despite our shortcomings you want to see them restored and that's why you give us the process that we call church discipline is to restore those who are struggling so let us be found faithful let us be found attentive to what you are saying but let us like Paul do it um, assertively but do it patiently in a way that they can see your love and not our righteous indignation. We thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, class. See you next time.